Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. Welcome back, EB-5 Investment Voice listener. You have been hearing us talk about EB-5 for a number of years. We've been doing this show for uh, three years now, right, Mona? About three years? <laughs> what doesn't time fly, Mark? Yeah, Mona. In that three years, EB-5 keeps evolving, and we keep predicting what is happening in, in the future of EB-5. And we're going to be doing a lot more of that in this particular episode, right? Yes, Mark. But the interesting thing is, over the last three years, we've had guests on who have predicted that this will happen and that will happen. And we've been waiting for legislation to be the event which really brings on uh, the the change. But it hasn't been legislation. It's been a natural evolving, really. Right. You know, and I'll I'll take some ownership of that. It's not just the guests. It's been ourselves, both yourself, Mona, and myself and, and others at Mona Shaw and Associates have been predicting, hey, this is about to happen. This is the, the deadline date. And things haven't happened, (laughs) you know, some of these big changes. Yeah, Mark, so this whole de facto evolution, really, without legislative reform, is a natural process. Um, And we have a great guest today who's who really understands the industry, was on our show a couple of years ago. And, you know, it's always good to get guests back. Uh, First of all, to say, well, you said this two years ago, (laughs) and it didn't happen. (laughs) But also because most of our guests are industry specialists, they are very much in tune with what's going on and they evolve as well. So it's really good to have their opinions over and over again. Agreed. Agreed. And we keep alluding to who this is. So let me go ahead and introduce. (laughs) We have back to the show, Payment Atari. Payment is the co-founder and partner of Integra Finance and is a seasoned investment professional. And now he's a seasoned podcast guest on EB5 Investment Voice. He's been working in the financial industry for over 30 years, and it spanned from a lot of different things, from international equities to to real estate and a lot of things in between. And he himself has also been keeping his finger on the pulse of EB-5, which makes him an ideal guest to bring him on and talk about what's going on with EB-5 today. Payman, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. Yes, it's very nice to be back. I'm just a little concerned that I'm now going to be questioned about some of the things I predicted (laughs) two years ago. (laughs) <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure Mona keeps it light because I want to look forward. I don't want to look back too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Payman, we, we were just saying just uh, a, a moment ago that there has been a de facto evolution really without legislation. I don't see legislation coming anytime soon. I don't know if you know something that I don't know. I do see regulations coming in, but I see a lot of natural changes. Yes, uh, waiting for EB-5 legislation and a regulation is like waiting for Godot. <laughs> About to happen, but uh, but we're still waiting, basically. So uh, I'm uh, disappointed, but uh, I have to say that I'm not optimistic that there will be any legislation soon. Uh, as far as regulation is concerned, who knows? Uh, obviously, we have to wait and see. Well, Payman, I I know that in legislation, the announcements, and we're going to hear more about it at the Chicago convention later this month, that the regulations have gone through. We're at the stage seven of a nine stage process. So I think that the chances of the regulations going through by, let's say, spring of next year are pretty high. Well, (laughs) um, obviously, you've been in the business longer than I have, Mona. I've been in it for coming up to six years now and i'm so beaten by all the you know positive expectations with something happening or regulations coming and nothing's materialized and i'm kind of desensitized now so (laughs) just uh, believe it when i see it yeah but it's important because many of the topics that we've discussed just generally about the changes happening really relate to the increase in the minimum amount which i think will happen by you know early next year you're right about that in that and this is something, you know, if we do have clients coming to us looking for kind of structuring a new EB-5 project, that one must really go into it with 
the idea in mind that the changes, especially as far as the minimum investment is concerned, will be coming at some point. So therefore, the project, the offering needs to be structured to allow some flexibility or allow for the changes in case there is, the, the regulation does come into effect and requires a higher minimum investment, etc. So yes, I think it's important to keep an eye on that and be mindful of it. Right. Well, I think also that we would like our listeners to really understand how the changes within the industry with, for example, the, the fall of the Chinese market has really changed the size of the projects and the type of the projects that we have out there. I mean, go back to your last podcast payment two years ago, two to three years ago, we were still talking about the mega projects, you know, the huge regional centers, which are still there uh, to a certain extent, but gathering in people by the thousands from all over the world and a lot of them coming from China. That we're not seeing anymore. Absolutely. And to no surprise, of course. Over the years, we've seen thousands of investors, tens of thousands of investors really coming from China uh, into the EB-5 program. That, of course, has resulted in the retrogressions. And we can talk about some of the issues that I think are forthcoming because of that. But as it's becoming known finally in China and the, the investors are realizing that the weight is for their EB-5, even the conditional permanent residency, is much longer than they had been told. I think that you know we're seeing the results of that first fall in uh, quite a sharp drop in the number of investors from China. And so, yes, it's going to become much more challenging, if you like, for projects you're seeking a large number of investors to go to market and actually get it funded in a relatively short period of time. Right. So right now we're seeing a different type of model coming out. So along with your big regional centers, which, as I said, are still there, we are seeing a lot of smaller projects renting regional centers and a lot of clients, especially from places like India, doing their own projects and bringing in their friends. So I think you you used a wonderful term uh, earlier, the bespoke project as being the new trend. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, obviously a number of factors go into that. One is that quite contrary to the Chinese investors, uh, certainly our experience has been that investors actually, especially from India, they are looking for a different investment structure. They're actually looking for uh, an investment that results in an upside as well. This is financially in addition to the residency in the United States. Uh, And as such, of course, there are not too many projects that are uh, structured to give the investors somewhat of a different upside, financial upside. And so we are seeing groups of investors getting together and deciding they're going to do EB-5 as a group. Uh, they want their own type of project that they become investors, actually equity investors in the project together with a developer and get in at an earlier stage, which is a necessity now as well, given the time frame that it takes for a project to get structured for EB-5, you know, the exemplar approval, uh, all the financing to be put in place, and then the amount of time that it takes to raise the EB-5 funds. Uh, it's almost from a project perspective, a non-starter, uh, the, the amount of time it takes to, to really structure and raise EB-5 funds. And so, with EB-5 groups getting together, groups of investors getting together and basically looking to put together their own projects, uh, we are talking about a really a different kettle of fish. We are. And alongside with this different set of investors and the different types of projects, I know for a fact that we are learning a lot. It used to be that uh, a an project would give the investor maybe a half a percent or a quarter percent. And yet in the figures, in the finances, you would see at least six to seven percent being put aside for EB-5, which meant that there were a lot of people in between who were making money. So what we are seeing now with these new bespoke projects is that the investor is getting a much higher investment interest amount. Two percent is uh, what we're seeing for a lot of projects and for nothing more than I would say four to five percent. I think more than that. and I don't think that is realistic. Well, you know, I, I think it just depends on how the transaction is structured, right? So we're talking about two separate things. One is current income, uh, the interest that is paid to the investors, if you like, on an annual basis. And the other is potential future upside. The kind of deals that we have in mind in terms of st- uh, structuring and also kind of talking to some uh, groups of investors, 
would actually give the investor some kind of an equity upside as well. So the approach is somewhat different. The investors are coming together. They're bringing funding basically for a project. And the funding would come in, if you like, at a preferred equity kind of a position in the capital stack. The return on an annual basis is negotiable. You know, that's obviously, yes, we will see annual returns or, or interest income, if you like, or dividend income higher than the half percent that have been granted in the past. So, yes, two to five percent uh, to the investors is about right. But at the end of the project, uh, for the investor to actually maintain an equity holding that will provide them with even greater upside, you know, years into the future. So, that's what I say with Bespoke is that really the EB-5 investors are in control. They want to partner with a developer, of course, and an operator uh, who also has equity interest. But uh, at the end of the transaction, the EB-5 investors can also end up with some equity holding in the project as well, which might give them some upside in the future. Uh, yeah, of course, Payman, it's a lot of people cannot do their own projects. They may want to. I know Indians are more entrepreneurial than other nations, but we have many investors coming from other nations and listening to a podcast. And they're all like uh, listening right now and saying, well, it sounds good, but I, I, I'm still going out for those regional centers out there because I don't have time or I don't have the knowledge to do my own project. So what I really wanted to pick in your brain, Payman, is what is wrong now with the present RC model and how can we fix it? <laughs> Good. Well, uh, well, that's quite an open-ended uh, uh, question. And, and, I know. And, and, and 20 minutes isn't long enough. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, let's kind of look at things that have gone wrong. Right. In, in many instances, and, and I don't want to generalize because there are, of course, regional centers that are independent of the project sponsors and the project themselves. They act as, if you like, uh, the fiduciary for the investor. So uh, that's certainly uh, there are projects that are or there are regional centers that operate like that. But many, many. Which others, is my preference, by the way. I didn't used to have that. I used to like. Um, a project having their own regional center, but I've since seen and been and, and been taught uh, that that's not always the best way. I do feel that the regional center should be independent. Absolutely. I, I, well, I think that, that that's the whole uh, having this independent entity that basically looks after the interests of the investors, right? And that's that's where typically a regional center should act. But many, many, many projects in the EB-5 field, of course, the regional center is closely aligned and or are owned by the project sponsors and the developers. So therefore, their interests is more to take care of the sponsors rather than the investors. And so yeah. um, in certain instances, of course, that leads to abuse or in best case scenario when things go wrong, investors are not informed, of course, until it's too late. Worst case scenario, the project itself was never real. Uh, the money goes missing or gets spent on uh, you know, luxury condos and, and yachts and things like that. So the lack of oversight therefore becomes uh, very evident in projects where the regional center is closely tied with the project sponsors and the developers. So those are the problems. And I think that investors have become aware of that. I think certainly with all the various cases that we read about and hear about as far as fraud is concerned, projects that have gone wrong are concerned, the investors are now looking for projects where either the regional center is totally independent and takes on a fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the investors to look after their funds. A payment. I think when we look into the future, I think realistically there are two signs that we see along with the fact that the current project structure has changed. One of the signs is the fact that redeployment is going to be a very real issue. Project times are taking longer. Many of the projects have sold or have the ability to get their money back within two to three years, and they cannot give it back to the investor. So they are redeploying it into other projects. That is an issue. I feel investors need to understand that about projects before they invest. And secondly, I feel that once the amount does increase to uh, 1 million or even, even at the current amount, there is a higher expectation of the oversight that regional centers and even smaller projects should have. Yes, absolutely. Mona. Two things you touched on. So, uh, just first of all, redeployment. This is a freight train that is heading towards the EB-5 industry. Right. And 
It must be addressed. That's a great quote, Payman. I love it. <laughs> Watch for Hermione to write out afterwards about the freight train. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you know very well, Mona, of course, you know, there is a lack of clarity from USCIS about redeployment, right? You know, should the money be invested in, same TEA, for example, and many, many, many other stuff that, that we don't have a clarity of. That's, uh, it's understood. But the money still has to be redeployed. So there is no time. We cannot just sit around and wait for USCIS to, to really clarify the requirements for redeployment. A lot of the projects that, uh, uh, that investment started, uh, the project has been completed and either refinanced or ready to be sold. And so there has to therefore be redeployment or reinvestment of the EB-5 uh, funds. Payment, I think there's a connection here. I'm not sure our listeners get. With the larger projects, those did take a long time. Those did take four to five years really to get undergoing and before they could be in any position to refinance. But with these new smaller bespoke projects, the smaller apartment buildings and, and uh, the smaller projects turnover of those is really a year to two years, maybe three years. Right. Well, even therefore more kind of urgency in terms of coming up with strategies for redeploying. Employment, right. So I think that it, it, that means that really over the past few years, even two, three years where there's really been this massive volume of EB-5 capital that's come into the market. Now we're getting to the point that something has to be done. In other words, the regional centers, NCEs, the project sponsors need to reinvest that money. Now, of course, that necessity is there because in order for the individual investors to satisfy the immigration requirements, they cannot be paid the money back. So redeployment is a major issue that needs to be addressed by the industry. You know, there are ways, but yes, I agree with you. That's one area. And I believe you can assist in the redeployment structure, no? Absolutely. Well, there's two issues, right? One is that, of course, when the funds are reinvested, now we're talking about a different parameter. So now we're talking about investors' funds now being managed into different investments. And there's more complications in that whether the investors are now in a, still in a pre-conditional residency, right, a kind of uh, a pre-CPR, conditional permanent residency, or are they in post-conditional residency? permanent residency, uh, which is when they've actually received it and they're about to, they file for their 829s. And there are different uh, requirements by USCIS of investors in those different stages of their immigration process. When it comes to that, uh, then that's where the securities laws and regulations start coming in as to who is able to, on behalf of the investors, reinvest and reinvest those funds, whether they're in projects or whether they're in securities. And that's where investment advisors and the need to really engage investment advisors to act on behalf of the investors and really manage those funds uh, on behalf of the investors as they're being reinvested. Payment, though, who does that? It's not the NC, is it the investor? I, I, Mark, you had a great question earlier. I think you asked Payment, who pays for payment services for the advice? I, I did. That was actually before we started this show. And it sounds like yes. you were just about to ask that exact same question. <laughs> when he was leading up to it. <laughs> <laughs> so Payment, as Mona and I are saying, uh, how do individual investors engage you? How do they work with you? And what do they get out of that? As far as the individual investors engaging us, of course, that mostly comes prior to the investment being made. So as, as investment advisors, investors engage us to either do some review and research on a specific project that mm -hmm. they are looking at, in which case we do that for them, and or the projects that we would recommend to the investors based on... What's the common question? Do. What's the common question? Do they come to you and say, what projects do you recommend? Or do they come to you, the majority... Do they come to you and say, I already have this project in mind. What do you think? What would be involved in doing your own uh, third-party due diligence? And that's a good question. It's a mixture of both. We kind of get uh, both parties coming in. Right. A lot of investors who refer to us actually come to us from immigration attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have a project in mind, and therefore for them, we actually recommend the projects that we've already completed our due diligence on, and, and we basically can present what we believe would be 
risk adjusted investment. So for them. what what I'm hearing is a majority of them come to you and say, we don't have a project in mind. And I'm sure Mona will echo the immigration attorneys can't recommend a project. So that's why they send them to somebody like you. So if an immigration attorney uh, has a potentially B5 investor coming to them before they put their own foot in their own mouth and their own liability up well, somewhere else. Not, not exactly. No? Not exactly. No, no, not exactly. I mean, we are allowed to recommend if it comes up within the course of our business. So therefore, if, for example, we've done project documents and um, we think that uh, and when you do project documents, we spend a lot of time on due diligence and we really like that project. But that doesn't open you up for any liability? That's one of the little exceptions that the, it, the, ah, it is to the rule. So see, that um, we, can, we can recommend, we're not allowed to take commissions right. and we can recommend if it, it comes up, if it arises from the course of our business. Ah. And uh, in actuality, there are not a lot of lawyers who do actually do the project work too. The vast majority of lawyers really do source of funds only and mm-hmm. they really don't focus on the projects in order they have a, that kind of understanding because EB-5 has a lot of corporate and business components um, as well as securities components, which many immigration lawyers really are not set up for. So they feel more comfortable to go to another person who is like able payment. to handle. Yes, okay. yes, indeed. Oh, payment has taught us a lot, I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you. That's, it's really kind of coming in as that independent fiduciary and acting on behalf of the investors. So those are the times that we are engaged by the individual investor. But when it comes to redeployment, of course, that's not possible. The investor, an individual cannot come to us and say, look, my funds are invested in this particular project. Soon the project's going to get refinanced. Can you reinvest my funds? And that's actually not possible, even if, if we wanted to do it. So the redeployment must be, and the engagement must come from the NCE, the fund, the vehicle in which all of those investors are invested in. That's the new commercial enterprise, the NCE. The new commercial yes. enterprise, absolutely, yeah. In that instance, what happens is that uh, we're brought in, of course, we're providing the service to the NCE, to the new commercial entity, or in investment language, that's the fund, right? That's the vehicle in which the investors have invested their money, which then is invested on into the project. And then what we will do is on behalf of all of the investors would be to, first of all, analyze to see what stages the different investors are, the individuals are in that whole fund and then devise a redeployment strategy, and we would be then paid by the NCE. So, Payment, what I'm hearing is not only individual investors can come to you, perhaps referred by immigration attorneys, and say, what's a good fund? Or the individual investors can come to you and say, I have this project in mind. Is this a good project? So those are two different ways that the individual investors can engage you, but they can't engage you with redeployment. Payment, but what if the managing member has a full discretion to choose the redeployment project? What if the operating agreement has language allowing the managing member Mm. the full discretion? Have you seen that? Well, well, Mona, let me ask you, is is that a possibility? Can that be in some of the operating agreements? It certainly can. You can do anything. You can put anything in an operating agreement as long as everybody else agrees with it. That's why you should have a Mona (laughs) (laughs) to make sure language like that's in there. Yeah, Payment. Payment, great question. Mona, thank you for bringing that up. It is a great question. However, I think that when it comes to securities laws, right, so here's where the Investment Advisors Act starts coming in, right? So I cannot just go, uh, if I was not an investment advisor, and come up with an offering prospectus and raise money from investors uh, where they sign off saying, okay, you could do anything you want with our money, including reinvest our money in uh, different projects as well as maybe if it's time and we are able to invest in securities, you do that as well. Because then that uh, manager is acting as an investment advisor and would be acting as an unregistered investment advisor. So it's possible that in the documentation, the general partner or the manager is given some leeway as to what can happen, or what can they do with the funds. But uh, when they start making decisions uh, uh, unilaterally, without approval of the investors to keep on investing and reinvesting the money, then they are acting 
as an investment advisor. So there are solutions to that too. Well, Payman, let me stop you right there because I can tell that you are about to dive really deep and I want to make sure that we have enough time left in this episode. I'm sure you'll be back, perhaps uh, a hat trick, trifecta, your third visit <laughs> on EB5 <laughs> Investment Boys. We can dive in deeper into some of this. I think what's on a lot of people's mind is the increased investment amount for EB5. That's a common question, common concern that keeps coming up. Payment, what do you think about the increase in EB5 investment amount? What do you think is going to happen in the near future? Well, if the regulation does come through and uh, we will have an increase in the minimum investment amount that EB-5 best must deploy, there's some positives of that, right? So it means that a project will need a lower number of investors in order to raise a certain amount of capital, right? So that does make it a little easier. But let's say the minimum goes to a million for a TEA investment from 500,000, then a project sponsor will need you know, half uh, the amount of investors that they're currently uh, seeking to invest in the fund. So in some ways, it does make life uh, simpler. But at the same time, this is now we're talking much greater amount of money for an investor to invest in a project. Uh, therefore, the quality of the project, the way it's structured, some of the oversight measures, some of the return matters and, and financial issues become even more important going forward. So once we get to a, a higher investment amount, the investors will be spending much more time really reviewing all of those factors. And I think that it's going to be very important for project sponsors going in the future, bringing out EB-5 projects, to really pay attention to the structuring, the, as I said, kind of protecting the investor's interest. And also, as far as the potential returns are concerned, as Mona said earlier on as well, that's going to be important as well. Payman, there's so much more to talk about. This is a deep subject, which is going to evolve even more um, as time goes by. We're seeing all of these this happening just with the simple change of, of the type of projects that we're seeing on the market I do expect you're going to do the hat trick and be back on our show again. We look forward to it, right, Mark? We do. Payment Atari, uh, Integra Finance, uh, thank you so much for coming on EB5 and Investment Voice. I I wish we had more time to dive in to each one of these areas. And yeah, it it sounds like you'll be back in the near future. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.